guys, today I'm really excited to have Adam Carroll on the show. I met Adam not too long ago and think you will love this episode. You'll also love all the things that Adam can help you do when it comes to shredding your debt, making your income much more efficient. Adam has decades of experience working with families and business owners who are interested in creating massive efficiencies when it comes to their income and wealth building capacity. With an unwavering commitment to helping people make the most of the money they make while limiting risk, reducing tax liabilities, and increasing liquidity, Adam has spent 15 years helping people do more with the money they make. He is an internationally recognized financial literacy expert, author of three Amazon bestsellers, a two-time TED Talk speaker with over 6 million views on YouTube and TED.com, and is the creator of Broke, Busted, and Disgusted documentary, which aired on CNBC and is shown to hundreds of high schools and colleges across the country. We're going to have a link for you to see also. He is the host of Build a Bigger Life podcast and curator of masteryofmoney.com and founder of The Shred Method. You guys are going to love this show. Listen in. You may need to go back and listen to some things over again. We talk about banking. We talk about how banks make money off of you. It's all very, very interesting and exciting to me for you to know this information. Be the change you want to see. Make a difference by giving your money a purpose, a mission to do good. Welcome to Money With Mission, where we show you how to create passive income so that you have options for how to work and how to live your life while leaving a legacy of positive social impact. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us, Money With Mission. Felicia, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be here and to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. I know money is everybody's <laughs> favorite topic sometimes, and then most a lot of us actually hate talking about it, which is probably right. more of a problem than loving to talk about it. Um, cause we, then we, we don't talk about it and we don't talk about it when we're kids, our parents don't talk to us about it. Then we don't talk to our okay. kids about it. And this cycle just keeps going on and on. How did you start to start that idea that talking about money was a good thing to do and something we should do? Well, it, I mean, I was probably a, a product of the same kind of family that most people come from where you don't really talk about it. And I knew that there were, um, there were arguments that were had in my house yes. growing up. Yes. I didn't know the context, but I had an idea of the context because usually it was after, you know, my dad brought something home or my mom went shopping for a little too long or whatever, and they would raise their voices at one another. And, I, you know, candidly, I got to a point where, and I remember this very distinctly, Felicia, um, my dad and my mom had an argument. My dad stormed out of the house and was walking on the gravel roads in which we lived, but it was pouring down rain. And I thought deep down he was going to get hit by a car uh -huh. because people would come flying up over the hills and they wouldn't see this guy walking in the rain. And why would someone be walking in the rain? Right. And I think it was at that point that I, I had this subconscious realization. I was never going to fight about money hmm. because I thought that's what created that, right. That fear and the uncertainty and you know, was I going to lose my dad that night because of some stupid money decision that was made? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, my wife and I got to a point where we just said, listen, if we're ever going to have conflict, we need to have it out. We need to talk honestly about it, but let's just put ourselves in a financial position where we never have to fight about money. That's just a much okay. easier place to come from. So to not fight about money, you have to talk about it so that you can be yeah. on the same page. And this is very interesting to me because I have a thing going on in my life with my kids, one of them's looking at getting married and I don't think they, well, they talk about money, but not the way I think they need to. Yeah. Sorry, honey. I did bring that up. <laughs> um, so how did you, how do you, how did you decide, or how did you guys talk to each other so that you never had to argue about money? What, how did that conversation go? This yeah. is. We, when we first got married um, and I'll, I'll like, open up the kimono here, so to speak, and, and say I was a debt disaster. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I was a rich college kid and then quickly became a broke professional. Okay. And I was living on borrowed money, you know, student loans and credit cards. And um, when I met my wife for the first time, and we had gone on a couple of dates, and we had sort of revealed 
the nature of our finances in, in one way, shape or form. She just said, Oh, do you have some student loan debt? I was like, Oh, you have no idea. Huh. And she said, get rid of your debt or I'm going to get rid of you in, in no uncertain terms. And we, um, at first I was like, well, that's really harsh. And then I took a firm look at her situation. And here's a woman who had $4,000 in savings and a paid off car. And she was largely on scholarship. You know, she couponed all the time. She was just very frugal and, and, uh, careful with her money. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, uh, let's try it your way. Um, cause obviously I've done it the other way and it w- it did not work for me. Um, and so when we first got married, we had agreed that we would live differently than our parents live for sure. And we were going to live lo- different than most other people would. And, and we kept telling ourselves, if we do for two years, what most people won't do, we can do for the rest of our lives, what most people can't do. Can't do. Okay. Uh huh. And so for two years, we lived on one income knowing that, we were going to want to have kids. It, it was in the cards that one of us would stay home with the kids at some point. And um, so we, uh, through a lot of reading, a lot of study, we had some conversations around money. And, and one of them was led by a book called Smart Couples Finish Rich by David okay. Bach. Okay. And the book basically said that men and women have different risk tolerances. And painting with a very broad brush. Most men have a higher risk tolerance than, than women do. Yes. And so the, the author suggested that you ask your spouse, how much do you need in savings to feel safe and secure? Yes. And when I asked Jen that question, she said $30,000 without skipping a beat. Uh-huh. And I thought she'd hit the Listerine too hard that morning, Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. She obviously had been thinking about it because she, you said without ever skipping a beat, she came out with that number. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And and the interesting thing is she's the one who got you to realize that you needed to live differently to be able to do the things you needed to do. Indeed. Indeed. And, and it was, I think I was of the mindset, which I got as a byproduct of the how, home I was raised in, but it was kind of like, well, we'll figure it out. If we want it, we'll get it and we'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And ultimately what had, what had happened was that meant my parents were going deeper and deeper into credit card debt throughout the year and then hoping on the Christmas bonus that they could pay it off. Okay. But ultimately what, what they do, what families everywhere do is we begin paymenting ourselves into a corner. So we go, I can afford the payment. I can afford that payment. I can afford this payment. But then there's very, very little left over yeah. to be able to get yourself out of debt. And that's where I found myself. And Jen was just, um, she, she was raised in a different household. It was all about how much of what you make you keep and not having debt and all of that. And it, it was, um, very opening when we started living that way, just how much more free I felt, uh-huh. how many choices and options and all of that, which I think deep down, like if, if, if our money has mission, if we have money with mission, it is to give us freedom and flexibility, choice and option. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there's so much to talk about. I'm going to go back to the debt, student loan yeah. debt. We're talking to a lot of physicians out here. And I had a friend recently who revealed to me, she had $425,000 yes. in, in student loan debt. I was talking to, listening to some other um, physician podcasts, talking about six figure debt. It just didn't occur to me. And I don't know why, because I know people have a lot of debt coming out of school and I know how long sure. medical school is. Um. Okay. So we go, we, decided as a physician, as a student, that this is what we wanted to do. And we couldn't do it on our own, but this is what we wanted to do with the thought that once I get my job, I'm going to make enough money to be able to pay this all off. And I don't think we realize the handcuffs we put ourselves in when we get yeah. there. What? Let's start at the beginning. Do you talk to students before they go into student loan debt to help them manage that in a different way? And then we can go to the inside where you don't meet them till they're already in that debt and how you can help yeah. them start to feel freer. Like you said, and one of my things is give people options. You need to have options yeah. in your life so that you don't have to be tied to that. Well, I'm going to say nine to five, but we know medicine is not nine to five, yeah. oh 12, boy. 13, 14 hours a day, yes. seven days a week. So Start at the beginning. Do you talk to students before they get into debt? If you can get to them, of course. And how do we get more of them to you? The the short answer is yes. Uh, without question, we need to talk to young people before they get into that that massive student loan debt. Um, 
you know, going back in the the way back machine here, 20 years, when I started my career, I was a speaker on college campuses. Okay. And what I would do is I would go in and, and educate young people on the perils of student loan debt, but also just simple things. Like if you can eat it, drink it, or wear it, it doesn't go on plastic. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, because we have students everywhere that are just swiping their card. Now, many of them are using a debit card. Maybe they're using their Venmo card, but you have a lot that are using a credit card. Yeah. And so I was giving them messages about scholarships or the single, you know, applying for scholarships is the single highest paying part-time job you'll ever have. And the mm-hmm. goal should be to go out and do that and do it uh, regularly and often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was having these conversations with students and I would ask them at every school that I had presented to, and I've been on over 750 campuses in the last 15 years, I would ask them, how much will you have in student loan debt? And their answers range from 20,000 to 120,000 for, for an undergrad degree, mostly. Mm-hmm. And then I w- had a number of them that just said, I don't know. I don't know yeah. what my debt's going to be. And so throughout that process, I realized that there was this massive unknown for most students, which was maybe it was a disconnect between how much I'm borrowing and how much that I'm borrowing, I have to pay back and how much it's going to be when I pay it back. Mm -hmm. So you get a physician that has 400,000 in in student loans. If given the opportunity to pay that back over 21 years or 25 years or 30 years or whatever it is, it's going to be eight or 900 grand. Um, which is a massive amount of money that that could lead to greater wealth down the road. So we started sharing, you know, for every one dollar you borrow, you pay back two, and in some cases two and a half. Yeah. And, and um, and then trying to just bring that to a, a more concrete level for borrowers. That's the okay. goal. So that's at the beginning before you've actually taken on all that debt. Yeah. Now let's talk to these docs out here who have all this debt. They have a job, they're making good money, yeah. but they can't get anywhere because their money is now going to pay this debt that they have to yes. get to where they are. You have some, you have some methods I see on your background. If you're not watching this, there's um, Adams in a room that says the shred method, which is something to do with getting rid of your debt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I'll give you an example, a case study first, Felicia, and then I'll, okay. I'll jump into that. Um, two, two, actually, I'm working with a client right now who's a surgeon. Um, his wife owns her own practice as well, and they are nearing the end of their working career, uh, okay. or would like to be, you know, maybe five or six years away and still have about 1.3 million between, uh, you know, practice loans, uh, equipment loans, vehicles, uh, homes, all of that. And what I said was, listen, it's possible to get out of this and you really don't have to change your lifestyle that much, but you do have to change how your cash flow goes through your, your personal economy. Okay. Um, and, and, a, another case in point, I, I met a doctor of veterinary medicine, uh, when I was out doing my, uh, presenting on college campuses and she had, uh, $298,000 in student loans. And it was an extenuating circumstance where she had gotten mono one of the years of her grad program and had to retake the entire year. So if you can imagine, you've already paid the 60 or $70,000 to go to school for that year and then have to do it all over again. Yeah. Um, And she was saying, well, I'm just hoping it'll be forgiven at some point. And so she was just making minimum payments, you know, and unfortunately the minimum payments that the U S department of ed allows us to make and some private lenders is barely enough to cover interest interest. Right. And then (laughs) the rest of it all gets tacked on the back of that, that loan. So there are folks out there that have six figures plus in student loan debt that may never be out of it unless they actively and aggressively go at knocking it down. And so that's how I would introduce the shred method is I want you to ask yourself if it took me four or six or eight years to acquire the debt, it shouldn't take 20 years to retire the debt. And that's the challenge. People will will go into debt for four or six or eight years to go to school and sometimes more, 10 or 12 mm-hmm. to be a specialist. But then they'll say, well, I have plenty of time to pay this off and I'm just going to make the minimum. And I want to live my life now, which I don't fault anyone for. Right. However, when you're making those decisions now, you'll wake up 20 years from now and go, I still owe how much? Yeah. How is this possible? 
Yes. And so our goal should be to really go after it. And I, and I, I always say, let's go at this like a laser through a cheese log. You know what I mean? Just go to the heart of it and knock it out and then be done and feel wonderful about the freedom of not having that on the back end. I, I don't know. My friend that I was telling you about that has the 425 has a friend who was advising her. She was planning to pay it off over just like 12, 13, 14, 15 years. And he yeah. told her, he says, why don't you just really pay it off in three years and think how free you're going to be once that's done. Yes. And she started recalculating how she was thinking about that. And she goes, I can really do this. I have, I don't know what, we didn't go into the how of it. Um, but to think about not having to have that debt and student loan debt is one of those non-forgivable debts. If you bankrupt yourself or whatever, you still have student loan debt. It's not going away. That's right. Um, all right. I'm sure there's people out here thinking, okay, come on, come on. Don't Share just it. keep hitting around at it. <laughs> Tell us how to do it. Okay. <laughs> so the key is your income, Felicia. And this, this may seem like a really duh statement. But the key is your income. Your income should do four things. It should pay your expenses. Most people are pretty good about doing that. It should eliminate debt. Most people are terrible at doing that. It should build wealth and you should be able to do good and, and or have fun with it. Okay. So those are the four things that your income should do. And most people are really good at doing two of the four, paying their expenses and having fun. And that's it. And you're not including your debt. Are you, are you including like your mortgage and those kinds of things in your expenses? You bet. You okay. bet. Because okay. people will pay those, right? We pay our expenses and we go, hey, I'm good. I paid my mortgage and I pay, maybe even paid it ahead a month or two. And we do the same thing with credit cards or student loans. And we go, oh, I don't have, I don't have to make a payment for another month. Yay me. And this is all part of the, the banking game. Yeah. And I think um, this is a sidebar statement, but when people realize that that we as consumers, that you, the listener, you are the vehicle for compound interest for the bank. Mm -hmm. So whenever you borrow money, you are the one making those banks lots and lots and lots of money. And over the last several years, banks have, have tagged record profits because we just continue to borrow and don't question how we pay it back. So if so our income- Will you yeah, go, go into that a little bit deeper? I know you thought, so that was an aside comment, but that's really yeah. important to me. And I, I really, really want people to understand banks and yeah. how banks make money off of you. And I don't know, I remember as a kid wondering how do banks make money and yes. nobody could explain that to me. And yeah. then I grew up and I realized, oh, this is a business like everything else. And totally. I'm how you make money. Go in, go into that just a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy to. And then don't let me forget to go back to the four- to for uh, keys to your okay, income. gotcha. <laughs> so the way a bank makes money is something called the fra fractional lending system, or fractional reserve banking, which is basically where if you were the bank and I put a thousand dollars in your bank, mm -hmm. you only have to hold an amount of that money, right, of mine in liquid reserves in order to say, hey, your bank, your your money is safe here in my bank. So I drop a thousand dollars in savings into your bank and you then go out and you loan out $9,000, nine times what I deposited in, mm -hmm. in loans. Mm -hmm. So you might make nine different loans of a thousand dollars might be one $9,000 loan, but what that $9,000 that goes out there is getting paid on at somewhere between 5% and let's say 25% if it's a credit card, right? Right. And everyone that's paying that money back likely also has a thousand dollars sitting in savings, which means every single one of those people then gives you the ability to, to loan out another $9,000 for every single one of those. So the banking system, if you will, is really predicated on the fact that they can just whip up loans and money on paper. They have to have a certain amount sitting in their accounts, you know, to, to account for that. But, um, the the way that banks look at loans, loans are assets and, mm -hmm. and deposits are liabilities, mm -hmm. which is completely opposite. Not of how the way we, we think, about, think that. about it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So their liability is the money they have on hand and the assets are the loans they need to make. That means they need to make more and more and more and more loans in order to make more money. So right now, what you'll see is you'll see a whole lot of banks that are promising two and three and 4% deposit returns, right? Because they need the money to come in. And the reason they need the money in 
is that they can make more loans. Yes. Right. And yes. so it, when you start to realize this and you see the game, you drive by a bank and you see on the, the sign, you know, the monument sign, we're offering 4% returns on our CDs. And somebody's like, oh, dang, 4%, let's go get it. What I think to myself is, wow, they must really need deposits right now because <laughs> they're buying this money, you know? Yes. And you guys got to listen to this part again, because this is so important about understanding banking. They're paying you 4% if you're really lucky and they're yep. loaning your money out at double that eight to 20 something percent. Totally. So you're not making their anyway, this frustrates me so much at how this works. And think about this. If they, if they loan it out on a mortgage, which, which some banks do and some don't, but if they loan it out on a mortgage and let's say someone borrows $200,000 to buy a, a, a home, right? Mm -hmm. Starter home in most, most cities. Um, that person could make the payment on that $200,000 mortgage for the better part of a year or a year and a half. And at some point they fall on hard times. They can no longer make the mortgage payment and they go into a default or a foreclosure situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The bank has made almost all of the interest, almost all the payments that have been made over two years time has simply been interest to the bank. Right. Because the way that mortgages and student loans, uh, uh, coincidentally work is the majority of your payments up front are going to interest and a very, very little tiny bit's going to principal. And this is yes. part of why the shred method works. So uh, someone goes into foreclosure, the bank gets the $200,000 home back. They keep the two years of payments that were made on that home and they turn around and resell the home, whether for a profit or a loss, it doesn't really matter because if they sell it for a loss, they write off the difference of what was owed on the home and what they sold it for. And to, for them, that's a gain. So, yes. I mean, the, the system is engineered. I don't fault them. I don't villainize them. This is a business model. But when we understand how the business model works, we can function within the business model to yes. our benefit, not to the banker's benefit. Exactly. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's frustrating. It makes me angry, but to know the game is how you have to play the game. These are the rules. Okay. I can work within these rules. Now yes. I know what I can do. Yes. I love this part of the conversation, but I'm gonna let you get back to your four. <laughs> yeah. My four keys. <laughs> your four keys. It's like so the, pay expenses. Yep. Have fun. Pay off Eliminate. debt. And what was the other one? Build wealth. Build wealth. Okay. Build wealth. Cool. Put it, put it away, right? Put it away okay. for, for later. So here's what most people do. They pay their expenses. They have fun. There's a little bit left over. And Felicia, if you were trusting the gurus out there, what would you do with the extra leftover? What is, what are the, yeah. What are well, the I mean, say? I'm thinking you first, you want to put it in the bank so that you can have some money in the bank and build up your reserve in case you lose your job or in case, whatever you just you have money sitting in the bank. Yep. Yep. So we, we would be, uh, we would be accurate probably to say gurus would tell us six to 12 months in the bank, keep it there safe and yep. secure. You yep. know, you can touch it. You can see it. It's accessible. It's guaranteed, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't, I don't uh, discount that. I think it's important to do that. But I question, particularly for, uh, for, a, for a doctor, for a physician of some kind, if you know that your income is pretty consistent, and obviously we should all have disability insurance. If something goes awry, we're going to make some money somehow. Yes. Like the yes. one thing we have to protect yes. is our income making ability. Yes. But at some level, if you have 12 months worth of, of living expenses and you've got four to 600K in student loans, and you've got a massive mortgage and all of that. My question would be, do you need, do you need access to the money or do you need the money available? And availability is it sits in the bank and you can go pick, you can go count it every Saturday if you want to. Um, but access means you could gain access to it from somewhere if you needed it. And this is really how the shred method works because where the gurus are telling us, oh, just pop that money in savings and you'll feel safe and secure. What I would say is our goal actually is to build equity in our home. So if this is what we owe way up here at the top of the house and we start chunking it down little by little or a lot by a lot, depending on how much your income is, at some point, you're going to have a pretty significant amount of equity in that home. You have, mm -hmm. you know, it's the amount the home is worth minus what you owe on it. Mm -hmm. And if you have a home equity line of credit, 
that gives you access to that money, it's almost like having a certain amount in savings that you can access at any time. Now, you may not want to go get six months all at once out of the HELOC because that might be expensive. Yeah. But if we're talking about you know expenses that come up that need to be covered, the HELOC is there for those kinds of emergencies. Um, so the way the system works is your income actually is funneled through the home equity line of credit. So you would take out a, a line of credit, it could be a HELOC, it could be a PLOC, which is a personal line of credit, or a BLOC, Felicia, which is a business line of credit. Okay. Your income funnels through the line of credit. And the line of credit is almost always either zero or negative. It will never have a surplus in it. So it's not like a savings account. It's like a bucket that's okay. either empty or full, right? Okay. And when we when we empty the bucket, what we're doing is we're putting some of that money against our debts. So it could be our student loans. It could be our mortgage. It could be wherever. And when we fill it back up again, bring it up to zero, that's when our income comes in. And so what we're doing is we're leveraging short bursts of money out of the line of credit for a short amount of time, could be days, right? Could be anywhere from three to 10 days. And then our income gets dumped in again and it fills it back up to zero. So to give you real life numbers, let's say that you made $5,000 in a paycheck. Okay. And you owed $2,000 against your home equity line of credit. Okay. And that may have been just for paying groceries and, you know, gas and haircuts and clothes and whatnot. And then what happens is you're about to get paid a $5,000 lump sum. Well, the shred method would say you owe 2000, you have 5,000 coming in. Your best bet is to send $3,575 and some odd cents from your HELOC to one of your debts. And it may be your mortgage. It may be your student loans. It may be any of the above. A car loan could be credit card, but we're going to knock down all the debts first. And what happens then is as soon as the five grand comes in, you owed 5,500. Well, now you owe 500 because you just put your income in there. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of. I think I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I'm not connecting. Um, you have this bucket that is the loan. Yep. That's the HELOC line of credit, the line That's of right. credit. So, okay, first line of credit, you don't have the money. You just can access the money when you need the money. That's right. Now I now start from there. Okay. So then your income would dump into the line of credit, but the LOC effectively becomes like your checking account. Okay. So, so now I got this $5,000 that I get into my bank account, but I then put it into the line of credit account. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yep. And because the line of credit can never go positive, it can only ever be zero or negative because it is okay. a, it is a line of credit, right? So you'd never have a surplus in there that before you made that $5,000 lump sum deposit, you would need to make room in the bucket, in that line of credit in order for the money to go in. Got it. Okay. And so where you put that is you send it off to pay you know, up something paying off something, right? <clears throat> so in the case of your friend who has $400,000 in student loans, I we would ask questions as as sort of the coach because we're we're both a a coaching program, it's a software product, but our main goal we exist to create freedom for people. Mm -hmm, However mm -hmm. that looks for them, it could be mm -hmm. free from student loans, could be free from car loans or credit card debt. Some people just say I want to be out of debt altogether. I don't want a mortgage, I don't want any of it. We would we would ask your friend um, let's look at how much interest is being charged on the student loan, yeah. how much equity you have in your property, and would it be better served to just knock down some of the mortgage first and then go after student loans or vice versa? And we would just coach them on how to do that. Which Okay. But the, the lion's share would go to wherever the majority of interest is being charged. So if the mortgage is at 3% and the student loan is at 7%, we'd probably go after the, the student loan first. Got right? it. If yeah. at least for a period of time yes. to begin knocking that down so the interest isn't as expensive. Yes. Um, or what we would call accelerating the amortization table. Because okay. as you accelerate the amortization table, more of your payments going to principal. Close to principal. Yep. Got it. Got it. Okay. I understand that. But, but it sounds like it's predicated on you own a house. 
So if we come to those folks that are just finishing residency and they've got $400,000 in debt and they can't even really think about how am I going to have a down payment for a house? Yeah. How can, how can they start even getting rid of some of that? Yeah, that's a great question. So my, my experience is that someone in residency is probably not making more than 50, 40, 50, $60,000 a year, probably. Yeah. Back when I was in there, it was like 30, but yeah. I don't know what it is now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's not very much. It's, you know, it's one of those things that I would recommend live as lean as you can while you're in residency. Mm -hmm. And if there is money left over, the goal should be to, to begin setting aside a little bit of a, of a nest egg, call it two or three months living expenses if you can. And then once you've done that, the goal should be to start knocking down some of those student loans. Um, and what I would do candidly is I would go after which are the smallest ones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure you and your listeners uh, recall this or know this from experience, but every semester you're in school is another student loan. Mm -hmm. So if you've been in school for eight years, that's 16 loans you probably have out there outstanding. And our goal would be to go knock out the small ones first to get rid of those little bitty payments mm -hmm. and just slowly work our way up the chain until we're going after the 25, 50, you know, $60,000 loans. Um, because once you get to that point, ideally you're now working full-time, you've got a full-time income and fundamentally you could go get a line of credit and use this strategy. Mm -hmm. at that point in time, regardless mm -hmm. if you have a home or not. Mm -hmm. And so much of it, Felicia, is just the mindset. Yes. That once you wrap your mind around how this works, I tell people all the time, I will never, ever go back to operating the way that I operated before I used the shred method hmm. because it's just so inefficient. Yeah. that And, and I can imagine, because I can't say I'm debt-free, but I love this and that I have been debt-free at one point and then built it back up. But what we the way we did it was similar to what you said is we ended up we paid off something we didn't do a line of use a line of credit but we paid off something and then took all the money we used to pay that off to pay off the next thing plus whatever that was and then the next thing and the next thing and yes. it was just finally got it all done um yes. this is really good one of the things i like to do is have people invest in things that brings them passive income but so many of my yeah. women physician friends can't do it because there's so much thinking about their student loan debt totally. or they would invest without telling me they had that much student loan debt. That was, yes. and I would be in the, this is like, no, we can't do that. You've got to get that taken care of before we start doing this. Yes. And even that freedom from that debt is freedom. Just, just realize that is like, oh, you mean I don't have my friend, I don't have to stay working at this place. I can get this paid off in three years. And then I can make choices about where I live, where I work, where all these different things that open up no doubt. because you don't have this debt tied to this place. You know, we, th and this, this speaks to the heart of that mindset comment I just made, because I, I really feel that we are, we are, and I don't want to say sold a bill of goods because it's not, it is a strategy. But the strategy that a lot of people are using is, well, just dollar cost average, put a little bit in for a really long time. And mm -hmm. hopefully someday it'll, it'll double two or three times and then you'll be able to, to retire on this huge, shiny pile of money. The challenge with that is a look what's happening right now in the market and what could happen over the next 24 to 48 months is we, we could have a very sideways market. And if somebody loses four years of appreciation in a strategy that says, oh, you'll make 8% a year for the rest of forever, then you'll be fine. It's really hard to, to, to justify that or reconcile that. I, I took a different approach and, and I will be 100% honest here, Felicia. I am a contrarian to a certain extent when it comes to things like investing, mm -hmm. although I'm with you 100%, invest for passive income mm -hmm. because net worth is an opinion and cash flow is a fact. Yes. Right? And I learned this <laughs> wow. from Robert Kiyosaki in his books. What, what your 401k is worth is an opinion at one point in time, mm -hmm. but if you know, you're making 700 bucks a month on that rental property or on the syndication or on uh, mm -hmm. an intellectual property play or buying ATM tranches or whatever it is, that money, you know, it's not guaranteed necessarily because every investment has an, an amount of risk, but if that money is coming in, we know it's there. Yeah. Um, and so I took a different approach and it was this. If 
the two greatest expenses in our life are taxes and the interest expense on debt. Mm -hmm. And I work really hard to minimize my tax liability mm -hmm. and work extra hard to minimize my interest expense. I think I can get to that compound interest inflection point way faster on the investment side. Yeah. And so this that's what we do with the shred method is we just go kill your debt, shred it, and then knock your investments out of the park in no time mm. because your expenses are super low. Your income stays high. You own more of it. And mm -hmm. I want to talk about that um, because that's critical too. People don't realize how little of their income they actually own. Yes. Get, go talk about it. <laughs> okay. So I had this, uh, sorry, I was teeing up the question, right? Okay. So, so <laughs> this, this, uh, this client of mine called and he said, I make really good money. I make $120,000 a year. And I said, you do congrats. That's awesome. And, um, and then we started digging in and I said, but my, my concern is you don't own a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, there's something called your, your interest to income ratio which is basically how much income do you make and how much of that income goes to pay interest every year. Okay. So this person was making 120, but between their mortgage and their car loan and their credit card debt, they were paying upwards of $36,000 a year in interest. Okay. So if you think about it, 120 grand a year, take out 30% for taxes, taxes conservatively, right? That takes us down. That's 36,000. So that takes us down to 84,000, take yes. another 36 out of that. Yes. And we're at what? 48. My math is right. 48,000, which is what was like, this they were individual living on. is living on. Right. And that's yeah. their, that's their mortgage payment. That's their, that's everything. Right. And I said, so it seems like you're making a lot of money, making a really good living. It's really hard to save when a third of your income goes out the door for interest and another third goes away for taxes. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, well, what do you recommend? And we laid out a plan, blast away his debt in about 28 months using his, his existing income, turned, um, uh, turned the number from 36,000 a year in interest down to about $15,000 a year in interest. Okay. And then said, okay, now let's turn on your cash flow building opportunities, which are investing in, in mass, like not mm -hmm. 500 or a thousand bucks at a time, but 5,000 and $10,000 at a time. Because mm -hmm. when you start doing that, man, those things just, they crank start. up Yes, and then compound interest works for you. Yes. Yes. This is amazing. And listen, you guys, this debt, and I, I, I always talk about taxes being a big expense. I don't talk about interest rate and in, your interest being a big expense because I've never thought about it, but now yeah. I am thinking about it. How can people, I, mean, I just imagine people are like, who is this guy and how do I get in touch <laughs> with him? And where do, how can I understand this a little bit more? Cause yeah. doctors want to really, really understand something before we get into it. So how 100%. can they find out? The, the best place to go is the shredmethod.com. Okay. And candidly, Felicia, when they go, they're going to, there's going to be a number of articles. There's a downloadable report that you can uh, get on how to find a HELOC or a PLOC or a BLOC. We actually have a savings analysis tool on the site. Okay. So if you go there and you plug in your income, your mortgage expense, your monthly expenses, it will kick out how fast can you be out of debt and how much can you save in interest. And it's not out of bounds for people to save $150,000, $200,000, $300,000 in interest when they use this system. Um, and, and I'm I, not to hold myself out as an example, but my wife and I paid our house off twice in eight years. And the reason we did it was we, we knocked out our first mortgage in 3.8 years. Mm -hmm. We saved about $180,000 in interest doing so. We lived mortgage-free for a period of about nine or 10 months. And then interest rates dipped to two and seven eighths percent. And I went and I did a cash out refinance of 200,000 and dumped it into a syndication Okay. The, the money from that, the income we make on a monthly basis covers our mortgage payment and then some. Okay. And we're shredding it at the same time. So, yes. so when you do that, you know, you're, you start to stack all these methods on top of one another and it's, it's not inconceivable to, to double your net worth in, you know, three, four, five years. Which is an opinion, right? But it anyway, an <laughs> <laughs> good call. That's totally. <laughs> Okay, the shredmethod.com. The shredmethod.com. 
Got it. Yep. And it'll be in the show notes. Anybody sitting out there with a lot of debt, whether you have six figure debt, five figure debt, whatever your debt is, you need, you should go. This is so important. You know how much I talk about not paying taxes, but not paying interest, more interest than you should, more interest than you have to is yes. also key to building your wealth. Adam, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll be going to the shredmethod.com and sending my kids to the shredmethod.com so we can figure out how to get rid of all of our debt. Well, that we are here to help. Amazing. We're here to help. We want, you know, as I mentioned, we're here, we exist to create freedom for people and whatever that looks like for them. So if I, if I may, can I offer your listeners just one, uh, it's a challenge a little bit, but it's kind of a mental exercise. Please. So I want you to think about three years from now, just think about how, how old you'll be, how old your kids will be, mm -hmm. um, what may have transpired in your life between now and then. And now I want you to imagine what it would be like if you had zero debt at that point in time and feel the kind of feeling that wells up for you. What would it be like to not have a house payment, not have a car payment, not have a student loan payment? And then what kind of options and choices do you then have for yourself? And that's, that's the feeling I want you to have always. Yeah. Um, because what we find is that people go, oh yeah, it must be nice. Or I don't know that I have the discipline but you're going to wake up three years from now and you'll either have debt or you won't. And it depends on the action you take. So if you yes. like that feeling and go after it, because it is, it is magical on the other side. Spend some time in that feeling really, really do this exercise. You guys imagine three years from now, not having the debt you have, no matter what it is, not having it and let the kick that thought out about, there's no way this can happen. You're right. There's no way it can happen if you don't do anything different. Precisely. But it can happen. Thank you so much, Adam. I really, really appreciate it. I this was amazing. So amazing. Alicia, Thanks thank a lot. you. Keep doing this work. It's super thank important. You. Thank you. You've been listening to Money with Mission. There are projects happening right now where you can have a great financial return while positively affecting the lives of others. To learn more about our opportunities, go to moneywithmission.com.